If you were selected as the sacrificial bride of a demon and targeted by his cult members for the final possession, what would you do? Rookie Jessica just wanted to be closer to her deceased father by surviving one shift at the police station where he once stalked from room to room, killing his co-workers before turning the gun on himself. She's sentimental like that. Only a few minutes into her shift, she finds herself the target of a ruthless, psychotic cult. They're bent on destroying her sanity so they can finish a ghoulish ritual set in motion before she was even conceived. Surviving them is a matter of rationality, quick thinking, and pure will. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the low god in Mala. In the woods where hippies have grown feral under the Dark Lord's influences, a cult that calls itself the Flock frolics in a river as four new members watch from the shore. After dusk, the cult gathers the four young women into a barn where they're in the cultists dance around them, praising something until they select their first victim. The girl is laid on the ground and held down by other members, as a leader, hidden by electronic distortion, tells us, We pray in the temple of the low god. Dagger in hand, he sacrifices her, and we're given glimpses of the carnage. <laughs> Cut to police captain Will Lauren, who's glassy-eyed and vacant in the precinct's locker room. When he opens his locker, his fellow officers have left him a newspaper clipping of his latest triumph. He broke up the flock, saving the three remaining girls and killing the cult leader, John Michael Malum. The article tells us that Malum was a complete anomaly with no paperwork and no history. The gift is mixed for the captain. He's plagued by the guilt of not saving the fourth girl. His friends tell him to take the win. Instead, without so much as a warning shot, the captain walks into the firing range and opens fire with a 12 gauge. Wait, 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 wait. Other officers find Lauren sitting in a holding cell with a gun in his lap and another dead officer at his feet. With his final words, he asks them to tell his wife and daughter that he loves them and that he's safe in the arms of his master. Then he puts the gun to his chin and blows himself into the abyss. Life is all about making stories like these, and the fandom stories you love last forever. With this video sponsor, Fan Home. Fan Home makes authentic build-up replica models of iconic pieces from brands like Marvel, Star Wars, Star Trek, and a ton more. No way! They even have an entire Fast and Furious collection with O'Connor Skyline, Dom's Charger, and other iconic vehicles. Go to fanhome.com, choose your collection or build-up model, and subscribe. Every month, you'll receive exclusive products and magazines. I got the Autobot Mega Chad Optimus Prime replica. Right off the bat, I could tell this thing is gonna be a serious replica. It's big, at over 23 inches tall. It's heavy, with die-cast metal. And it's intricate, just like the real Transformers from the movies. Not intricate in a tedious or frustrating way like other models. The build instructions are very well crafted, with great pictures showing how it all goes together. I really appreciate the magazine containing lore about his origins, his home planet, Cybertron, and his struggle leading the Autobots in their war against the Decepticons. All while trying not to accidentally crush Shia when catching him with his giant robot hands in the heat of combat which, let's be real, probably would have happened. To get started building awesome high quality models to display on your mantle, go to the link in the description box or fanhome.com slash nerdexplains. Choose your model or collection and subscribe. All subscribers will also receive an Optimus Prime t-shirt, key ring, mug, and two posters, and use my code NERD23. A year later, his daughter Jessica arrives for a ceremonial rookie shift at the derelict precinct where her dad worked and died after a run-in with the flock just a few blocks away. They sing, they resist arrest, they throw pig organs at her car. You know, the usual. Seems like they're a rash the city hasn't quite eradicated yet. Jessica isn't here for the scenery. Rooms are bare, ceilings are literally rotting overhead, and the sole officer on duty ain't exactly a people person. Officer Cohen is itching for a fight from the moment 
Jessica walks in. He tells her the flock escaped jail time on a technicality and have been arriving in mass since the verdict. He shows her to the main desk, gives her the main station's number and his own in case of emergencies, and warns her to keep the doors shut, perfectly dutiful, until he finds out who she is. Your father was a murderer. He killed my friends. He assumes she must be insane to volunteer for a shift in the place where he died. As a parting shot, he warns her to stay out of holding and leaves her for the night. He doesn't realize she's here on a mission to fill in the gaps about what happened to her father. Within a few seconds of his exit, the elevator takes a phantom trip past her floor. She goes to the locker room to find her father's locker padlocked. Then, hears wet footsteps running in the empty shower, and a basketball starts dribbling on its own in the gym. When she goes to retrieve it, she sees a man's silhouette watching her from a far doorway. Only then does she turn on the lights. You know what you don't pay for? The utilities at the place you work. This building is massive, ideally occupied by a single person, us. And we never had a reason to do a perimeter sweep to check the exits until right now. Turn on all the lights in the building. Bring us to saturation levels we haven't seen since midsummer. Not on the off chance this place is haunted, but because we can't be everywhere at once, we can watch all of the CC cameras in the building from the comfort of the office. Leave trespassers no place to hide. The precinct's equivalent of a doorbell rings. Jessica finds a belligerent guy talking nonsense at the front door. He says he misses his little girl and demands to know why she left him. I can take a couple of guesses. Seems to me that we've got our work cut out for us tonight. We've been here all of an hour and we haven't sat around down once. The question, I think, is what is our motivation for being here? If it were you or me, we'd never have volunteered for this janky assignment in the first place. Jessica's looking for answers, which she's never gonna find if she keeps getting distracted. The phone rings at the front desk. Jessica answers to the squeals of pigs and a woman's voice calling her Little Piggy. She hangs up, but the woman calls again, this time playfully implying that she's going to be butchered for markets before the sun rises. Jessica calls the incident in to the main office, but it's dismissed as a low priority when the guy finds out who her father was. Frustrated, she rushes to the locker room and shoots the lock off her father's locker. That's gonna be a fun firearm discharge report to file tomorrow. Inside, she finds the wadded up article and a picture before noticing the locker has a false floor. The box concealed within contains files of the flock case. The young girl Jessica's dad couldn't save was named Betty and her body was partially fed to pigs. A distant sound draws Jessica's attention. Over CCTV, she sees that someone has tied a massive pig up outside the front door. She calls it into the main station, but the other officer warns her to leave it and remain inside. He says the flock are causing problems all over town and warns that if something happens at her station, they won't be able to send backup. Great, makes sense to me. We'll just leave it out there. <laughs> Oh, come on. It has the flock symbol graffitied on its back, and they've named it after the murdered girl. Show of hands. Who knows better than to let it into the station? And what are you gonna do with it anyway? She stores it in a room and emerges to loud sounds of things moving around. In an old office, she discovers an external door propped open with a dustpan. She calls in a potential B&E, but the only thing that responds is more sounds of destruction. She finds the belligerent man from outside of rooting around her dad's box in the main office. He clutches a piece of evidence, screaming for her to tell him where she is. Unfortunately, Deputy Dumb looks away briefly to holster her gun and pull out her taser and turns to find him inches from her. Where is she? I swear to God, next, she's gonna be firing with her eyes closed. As a ghostly figure listens from down the hall, she cuffs him and guides him into holding. The ceilings are a patchwork of mold and rust. At the door to his cell, the man falls to the floor, screaming that his baby is here. Don't you dare. No, no, no! God. I want to like you, I really do. But that's strike one. She tries radioing for help, 
but the walls are made from your standard issue anti-radio wave materials. A ghostly whisper says it's still here. Behind her, the belligerent man begins to scream, barking for someone else to tell her that daddy can do it. She turns on the light and he lunges for the door through her. You think it might be time to pull out that gun? The taser, at least? Instead, she kneels near the crazy man. She willingly drops into a weaker defensive position on her hands and knees trapped in an 8x10 cell. Ugh, strike two. Don't worry, someone else gets the light for her. Sir. And it's not her cellmate. She lunges at the door like that's gonna do anything before her dad whispers in the dark that he's still there. The flashlight rolls to her across the floor. Okay, not gonna lie, that got a jump out of me. The door is suddenly open behind her because we've introduced ghosts now, so anything can happen. Yay. She locks the cell and returns to the main office. This time, she calls Officer Cohen. She asks him if the station is haunted in a lot of words, and she gets the reaction we'd expect from a roided out antisocial Wit. He tells her holding is full of black mold that causes hallucinations and tells her not to call again. And that's one lifeline down. Obviously, this is the point where we leave, but let's get back to that in a sec. On her own, Jessica turns back to her father's case file, learning that the sigil on the pig's back matches that of the Temple Baron, a demonic entity, harbinger of the that was worshipped by the flock. She also finds a USB drive. With no computer in the station, she walks outside to her patrol car to grab the console laptop. Perfect timing to witness a drive-by dethotting. A little too perfectly timed, if you ask me. Turns out, this lady of the night, Marigold, has a penchant for admitting crimes to police officers. She tells Jessica that she tricks to pay the bills in between murdering at truck stops. Marigold claims that she was in this station the night members of the flock themselves. Jessica counters they were killed in a shootout with the police, but Marigold insists she saw them hanging in a holding cell, dripping with blood. She begins to tremble, staring at something behind Jessica. <laughs> yeah, so this is a flock member disguised as a right? If Jessica doesn't stop collecting strays, this place is gonna turn into a sanatorium real quick. Jessica tells her to leave, but then doesn't accompany her to the door to make sure she actually leaves. Did you forget how many hiding spots this place has? How many external doors she could open and not reseal? Instead, the phone rings. It's the prank caller again. This time, she says that if Jessica hangs up, she'll kill the girl she's taken hostage. As a ghostly pig person appears in the reflection of the glass behind her. The color tells her she has taken one of the girls Jessica's father rescued from the flock last year. She says that John Malum commanded it, warning that he never died, but instead shed death like a tarantula molts its skin. The color warns they're finishing what Jessica's father started one year ago tonight. Jessica does the sensible thing, calls the main office to report it. Wouldn't you know it, the guy actually takes the call seriously this time. Turns out, all three of the girls her father rescued have gone missing in the last few hours. He promises they'll trace the line, but that's about it. Uh, sir, how about back up to our location? We've got ghosts, we've got a pig, and they know we're the kid of this important killer cop. Are you telling me this isn't the first place to secure before something else goes wrong? Fine, we'll come to you, with a vehicle tracking engaged and our sirens blaring like the whale of the damned. The only reason to remain in this station overnight is to act as bait when other officers are strategically hidden around the building, ready for the flock to breach it. At the very least, it's time to raid any remaining armory and remove ourselves to a more easily defendable room, not this wide office with a wall-to-wall -wall window on one side, too many doors, and an elevator leading to who knows where. Instead, Jessica plugs in her father's USB and really commits to freaking herself out. <laughs> I can hear the whisper! <sighs> 
Is it just me, or do none of these demon cults ever get anything in writing before they summon themselves into demonic slavery? Dude better be prepared to fork up gold in advance. Otherwise, what is the point? Jessica's phone rings, and she answers it, pausing the video to talk to her mother. The video on the computer starts up again on its own. The cult's members begin to sing, and when her mother hears it, she goes mental, screaming for Jessica to turn it off. Jessica presses pause, then the power button to no avail. In the video, a woman in red makes eye contact with her. Another calls out her name. The image changes to a recording of her sitting at the desk. She turns, but no one's there. Jessica watches herself walk around the desk and toss the box from her dad's locker on the floor. So, of course, she follows the demonic instruction manual and finds a used shooting target with the words still here written in blood. Sure, let's just trap ourselves in the dark dead end of a room designed for live fire, where someone has laid an obvious trap for us by taping a picture of our dad to a shooting target. What could go wrong? It isn't long before targets fly towards her out of the dark, one painted with a bloody temple baron sigil. When she tears it down, an otherworldly figure with fangs is there in front of her. Too bad she doesn't have a standard issue Glock on her hip or anything. She reaches the front door of the building to find someone has chained it shut from outside. Again, too bad she doesn't have a standard issue Glock she could use to try and break the windows or anything. She runs to the door the belligerent man used to break in, but it too is locked. Back in the office, she dials the main branch and begs them to send someone to let her out, saying she thought she could do a shift here, but she can't. The cop says she needs needs to be there, that the flock is only calling because they know she's the captain's daughter, implying that her leaving somehow diminishes her dad's cop killer legacy, and that staying will help the three missing girls. Um, how exactly? His soothing voice isn't tricking anyone. If the flock is hanging around, leaving love notes on pigs and girls, then why aren't the police already here? This guy is definitely in on it, and I'm asking to speak to his superior immediately. The next call I'm making is to the fire department, who can send someone over with a bolt cutter to open the front door so we can leave. The next time the phone rings, Colt singing drifts in from the phone, her radio, and the intercom. The elevator suddenly turns on. Jessica draws her firearm when the basketball flies out of nowhere. You see what I mean? This room is terrible for defense purposes. If we're not gonna leave now, like seriously, just bash out a window, walk out to our car, and go, then maybe let's walk five feet over, rewind at the security footage, and see what threw the ball. If it threw itself, we leave. If someone's upstairs or downstairs playing games with the elevator, we record it on our phone and send it to the jerk who told us not to call him. In the game of fight, flight, or freeze, anything's better than freezing. Or worse, just hanging around, hoping things will get better on their own, because they will get way worse. Jessica's computer begins playing video footage on its own, interrogations her father conducted of the cult members before he died. The cult women say John Malam is the low god's vessel. They tell Captain Loren to trust in his plan and that he's got a role to play as well. A bag suddenly wraps over Jessica's head from behind. She's temporarily stunned and wakes in a body bag being taken to the morgue. Unable to move, she watches as the coroner partially unzips her and the other cult members. Trapped in her own body, she watches the other cult members seize her back to life. She screams for help, but none is coming. Help! Oh! More members of the flock kill the coroner and spirit the other bodies away. Jessica regains the ability to move and goes to untangle herself when a blood-soaked ghoul sends her rocketing off the gurney. She snaps out of the vision back in the office. Looks like we've got a hereditary problem on our hands with the visions, cryptic calls, phantom whispers, and warnings from her dad. It's obvious we are the missing piece of this macabre death cult's plan to resurrect the low god. We're a pawn in someone else's game. 
game. And someone's gonna knock us off the board soon if we don't start being proactive rather than reactive. Someone calls out. It's her dad's old co-workers. The ones who survived his retirement party. Price and Hudson have cut through the chains and arrived to take possession of the crazy guy in holding. She asks for details about the day her father went gonzo. Price tells her he should have said something way earlier, but her dad was acting erratic, re-watching the interrogation video with the demon. He takes her to a storage closet and unveils the shotgun her dad used to send the rest of the station to their graves. He goes to put it back and... <laughs> Usually, I'd say she's a terrible cop for blocking instead of reaching for her Glock. But given these visions and what her dad did with his last few minutes on Earth, maybe that's a good thing. I'm starting to think the captain killed his cohorts while trapped inside a vision, which means it's hands off our weapons from here on out. Jessica finds herself on the Temple of the Low Gods compound, where she watches John Mollum baptize a baby in the name of his evil deity before handing her over to her mother. It's Jessica as a baby. She snaps out of it back in the main office, with no clear indicator of what happened to Price or Hudson. She hears the belligerent prisoner screaming, and finds the cell keys and a set of handcuffs in the hallway. Through the cell window, she can see Hudson holding a gun to the guy's head as he begs to be let out, while screaming that she must be present on the night of his arrival, that she must summon power and devote herself and participate in their ghoulish ritual for it to work. Thank you for those very useful instructions, my guy. You might have just given us everything we need to get out of this, and who doesn't love efficiency like that? Hey, Jessica, you maybe want to chase after the raging hulking dude who's now loose in your facility? Nah, let's just let him run free. We're in total rational control of our own mind and body. We're not slipping in and out of terrifying visions that suggest we're about to become the bride of the devil or anything. The guy hoofs it from the exit, but stops when a young girl's voice calls out from behind a door. We learn this this guy is the father of the one girl Captain Lauren couldn't save, Betty. She tells him she's in here. All he has to do is let her out. And this is why we follow people to make sure they actually leave. Jessica gets pulled back into home movie time and listens as the young version of her mother tells her baby that her daddy has just become a police officer and will come soon to save them from Malum. Unfortunately, Malum has a way of finding people. Down the hall, the pig in lockup knocks open the door, emerging with a snout covered in blood. Jessica's mom reaches toward her through the video when the pig transforms. <laughs> The mutilated form of Betty grabs for her, her leg eaten off, her face tenderized and pitted by the blunt end of a bat. Jessica bolts into the next room before locking herself in the old office. The thing hunts for her through the darkened room. She pulls her gun and shoots the demon down. Unfortunately, as I expected, she looks down to find the pig there instead of the demon, suggesting that using our firearm in the future is a good way to join our dad on the cop killer list. The front door buzzer screams screams, and Jessica arrives to find her mother there, begging her to open the door. Jessica asks if it's true that her mom was one of the cult, and Diane admits it's true. She says they left the cult after Jessica was born, and for a couple of decades, they were able to live normal lives, until last year when John Mollum showed up the same age he was when they left. Mollum wanted them back. He had plans for them. Before she can explain how that inspired Captain Lauren to murder, suicide, or whatever those plans were, Diane sees her late husband walk away down a nearby hall. Let's take a moment here to really strategize the escape of this sadistic theological game we don't know how to play. I'm choosing this point because after this, and really after Jessica allows herself to go chasing after ghouls in the first place, she's really been truly a goner. Without reason and perspective on her side, she's done for. And I'm here to snap you out of it before you're lost too. In this moment, with some sense still left in our fracturing minds. We can think through what we've heard. We now know that we were chosen before our birth to participate in a dark ritual beyond our understanding. It's happening tonight, as tonight is the anniversary of her dad's death and important, otherwise somehow. The cult has already made its presence at the precinct known. We know that the cult is coming here with three new victims in tow to complete the ritual summoning the Logod.
one. And two different people have told us that we must be present at the ritual for it to work at all. Usually, just leaving a situation like this is a cop-out. But with everything we know, choosing to leave is not a cop-out. Not this time. It's not the cheap answer. It's the right one. Any ritual with us at the center ends one of three ways. Either we're physically sacrificed, or we're mentally overpowered, or both. We can't shoot our way out because we can't trust our senses. We can't ourselves because that would be a physical and mental sacrifice, feeding right into the hands of those who wish to consume us. The choice is simple. Stay and die, or leave and probably also die. But as a free person, disrupting some dark and sinister plot. If we're low-jacked so that the flock knows our movements no matter where we go, then they're unbeatable and were from the start. But I don't believe in fate or the ability for anyone to properly plan anything this well, so disrupt disrupting their behaviors, becoming unpredictable, moving in incalculable ways is the way we beat this thing. Eh, at least for tonight. Leaving is the first step. We need to remove ourselves from the place with all the reminders and visual clues they can use against us. We need to go where no one we know has a reason to recognize us, make it impossible for them to trap us in a vision of any quantifiable meaning or value. Basically, we want to always know that what we're being shown is untrustworthy. We want to know the scary stuff they're showing us is fake. If we're in a canoe or on a lake, there's no way for them to make the sudden arrival of our mom or dad or another police officer seem real, neutering at least one of their superpowers. This way, we can ride the visions like a bad trip instead of being destroyed and manipulated by them. Once we can recognize any hallucination they throw at us, we need a non-lethal way of shocking ourselves out of it. For panic attacks, some people pop a piece of ice into their mouth to take their mind off the invasive thought that's causing them to spiral. We need our own ice cube, and we have one in the holster on our hip. We have a taser. Crank that bad boy down to the lowest shock setting. When we realize we're in a vision, we give ourselves the old zap. It's a great option too, because if the hallucination removes the taser for any reason, the lack of one also becomes proof that it's a hallucination. You'd also think that someone as obsessed with her dad's death as Jessica is would have researched this cult. She'd know a general number of cult members at least. If it's 50 known members, quadruple that number just to be safe. A Assuming there's 200 members, we need to go where there's thousands of people. Might be tough in the middle of the night, but a big city will have things going on. Take our patrol car with its nifty siren and drive at top safe speed for as long as it takes to reach a packed location. We leave our gun in the car to avoid temptation. Then we sit in plain view among many, many people, buying drinks, singing karaoke, and anything else to draw attention to ourselves. So it's difficult for a cult to snatch us with without someone noticing. We don't move. We our pants if we have to. Armed with a taser that can knock us back into reality in a car or heavily crowded place where no one knows where we are or who we are, we can wait out the night. Maybe all of this just postpones the inevitable, but once I can no longer trust my own senses, then any attempt to escape is better than none. Remember, we just have to stay out of other people's hands for another 8 to 10 hours. Is the cult going to try the ritual again if they can? Yeah, but if we can make it to tomorrow, we've bought ourselves more time to reach out to the Pope for a mega blessing. Diane and Jessica arrive to the office, where they find an old figurine that belonged to Captain Loren. Once again, before anything can be resolved, a sound interrupts their conversation. A woman in the building begins screaming. Jessica tells her mom to stay there and lock the doors, which she immediately disregards to wander off like a bad toddler you've been forced to babysit. Jessica begs for back up over the radio again before entering the gym to find a cult member holding a gun to the head of one of the missing girls. Jessica holsters her gun to negotiate, but one eye here has the upper hand from the start. Patience, Piggy. Your time will come. One Eye says that her own part in this is to help Jessica prepare for the ritual. She'll need power, the kind of power you get from living beings. A pig is something, but nothing compared to the of a sacred deer. I, I mean, killing a human. One eye kills the girl. Jessica reacts by drawing her weapon and mowing the crazy cyclops down before all breaks loose. <laughs>
up. Jessica does the first fast thinking she's done all day, locking them in the gym using her handcuffs on the door. She races to the office, but of course, her mother's gone AWOL. The phone rings. It's the main office checking that she's okay. The guy says they believe the flock is planning a raid, right before asking if her mother's okay. Jessica finally realizes what I've known for a long time. This guy isn't who he's claiming to be. Turns out she's been talking to good old Satan simp John Malum. He tells her her mother's always been so reliably faithful to their cause. He tells her that a vessel must be chosen by its passenger and a low god is coming tonight. Behind her, a figure staggers into view. She draws her gun to find Betty's father is even less there than he was before. He charges her and she fires, killing him as he lands on top of her. She listens to the colt banging on the far door until her mother screams for her from somewhere within. She maneuvers through the building, killing another cult member as the others begin singing. And she finds one more girl dangling from the ceiling. Jessica backs away and finds Price and a bloody Hudson beckoning her into the darkened room. Whether we killed them or her dad did is unclear. Either way, with the viscera on big boy there, it's obvious they're dead. She turns another corner and sees another cultist killing the last girl. Unfortunately, she just can't land that headshot in time. <laughs> Jessica proves her local police academy's procedure for blood loss was basically wash her hands in it as the girl dies. Her mind snaps as she sees her father's ghost in the locker room, practically chasing phantoms and spirits at this point. She fires randomly at cult members on her way into holding, hitting some, missing others, until she comes to yet another sacrifice hanging in a holding cell. Instead of doing the quick obvious thing of shooting at the rope she isn't tall enough to cut, she goes with the Holden flail with the knife tactic instead. <laughs> Well, if Jessica wasn't lost to madness before, Diane screams, snap Jessica out of it. She retrieves her dad's shotgun and descends into the station's basement, where the cult members have rigged one of those universal Horror Night Halloween shows. She enters the shooting range, where a masked figure sits on a throne made of lawn tools. Seriously, that's a rake, and that's a shovel. I admire the thrifty ingenuity. It really makes it feel like any of us can afford to summon the Dark Lord. She pulls off the mask to find John Malum looking worse for wear. Behind her, victims and cult members alike surround her. They part to let the low god through. <laughs> Jessica shoots, but it does nothing. The thing that looks like someone put Patrick Starr on a rack approaches. It disengages its gross skin mask and latches onto her face. She finds herself back upstairs, firing wildly at cultists like she's some sort of Silent Hill level, while John Malum tells her the low god sent him to find her before she even existed. He calls her the Queen of Sunless Dawns as a new whore manifests before her. Jessica. Yeah, I called it. Seriously though, with just an extra step of perspective between me and this situation, we can see this was calculated and that Diane is probably in on this. And that at no point was Diane smart enough to go, maybe I shouldn't step out in front of my daughter when she's out of her mind wildly firing with a shotgun. At least you finally understand your dad in all the terrible ways you wanted to when you took this shift. Lost in the sauce, Jessica's vision traps her surrounded by laughing cultists victims. The Temple Baron whispers into her ear, and Jessica begins to laugh. Her lifeless body is dragged to the basement as John Malum tells us that even though our pathetic human world is minuscule, a board game on the cosmic den table, there must be gains for the world of monsters and gods. He says his union with Jessica will allow others to begin their game too. As Jessica resurrects in a throne beside the Temple Baron, this chapter of an obvious ritual using its viewers, all of us, to its twisted goal finally ends. So, like, what do any of the flock get? out of this? This is as dumb as a pyramid scheme, and I have seen zero benefits yet. Ultimately, if your own senses can be manipulated to the point where you're bouncing around in space and time at random, you have to break that cycle before you have any chance of surviving, leaving 
using a taser on ourselves, and beating out the dawn is possible for anyone not intentionally chasing ghosts down dark, moldy police hallways. Jessica should have left after her first true vision, when she saw flock members dangling from the ceiling and holding. If she had, there's no telling how far she could have gotten, using her own knowledge of the cult and removing herself from triggers the cult could use against her. She's toast the moment she gives in to the mystery and mayhem swirling around her like a radioactive cloud. We aren't making that mistake. We are reading the many haunted rooms in this building and focusing on keeping our rational mind working for us, not against us. We're leaving. We're paying attention to our bodies, recognizing visions and zapping ourselves out of them. We're thwarting the cult members by staying out of reach in a crowded city or by hopping on a plane to who gives a f the creepy rhymes and repeated chants throughout told us we must participate for the ritual to work. So, we're not participating. It's as simple as that. For that reason, I think Malam was beaten. And remember, when negotiating with the devil, read the fine print.